Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. As always, we are so glad everybody's here, and particularly if you're visiting with us, we want you to know you're our special guest. And uh, we ask that you do a couple things for us. If you would, take a yellow card that you find on the pew in front of you and fill it out. And uh, you can put it in the collection plate as it comes around. We'd appreciate that so much. Also, we always ask that our visitors hang around a little bit. we love to get to know you a little bit better and uh, give you a good pat on the back or something like that. I don't know. We don't shake hands as much anymore. But... Uh, <clears throat> For those of us, when we have our prayers this morning, I'd like to uh, list those that are uh, having some problems. Let's keep um, the Bullock and Aldridge family in our prayers. Uh, Diane Bullock Aldridge, I knew her as Diane Aldridge, uh, passed away. The visitation is Tuesday, February 21st from 10 to 11 at Chancellor and Byron with a graveside service to follow. Also, Vicki Oxley, let's keep her in our, in our prayers. She's uh, had outpatient surgery. She's at home getting over that surgery, so please keep her in your prayers. Ray Bell is to have surgery this Tuesday. It's not, probably not going to be a very easy surgery. It'll be very long and drawn out, so please keep him in your prayers. Also, continue to pray for Kay King, the sister of Francis. She had a wreck, but my understanding is doing pretty well now. And Chris Ray, who is having trouble with seizures. And we got a call this morning from Terrence, or really from Shonda Freeman, in regards to her father-in-law, that'd be Terrence's father. He had to go to the emergency room this morning, and they're there with him now. Uh, my understanding, he's not drew, doing real well. And also, uh, Terrence's sister, Kim Wiggins, has cancer, so keep her in your prayers. Julia Lewis is still at home uh, after having back surgery, and she's home recovering. Uh, also, Mary Horton, same. She's home recovering from her surgery. I got a note this morning that Jeff Wall is homesick, so let's, uh, let's keep him in our prayers. So there's a number here that if you want to add that to the list that we've already got going in our bulletins, that would be great. Uh, and certainly want to keep them in your prayers this morning and during our week as we pray to our Father. Also, I've got a note here from uh, Annette Parrott. It says, to our church family, Hewlett and I would like to express our love and appreciation for all you've done for us. P appreciate the cards, prayers, and food that you gave. Please continue to pray for Hewlett as he adjusts to being in the nursing home. So we certainly wanted to do that uh, to keep Annette and Hewlett in our prayers. First song this morning I may or may not mention is 446, number 446. As we begin our worship this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this time of worship, Father. Father, my prayer is that as we begin worship at this time, that our minds might be focused on you and your Son, and the graciousness and love that you've shown to us through the years, Father. Father, we're grateful for your Son and his death on the cross and the blood that was shed for us that makes all this possible. And Father, I ask that, again, that as we, as we sing songs of praise, as we hear your word, Father, as we remember your Son through the Lord's Supper, that our minds will be off of the world and those, those things outside these walls, Father, and be just on you. Father, we oftentimes do things that are contrary to your will, and so we do ask for forgiveness at this time as we begin our worship. Father, love us and take care of us during this time. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 446. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for when Jesus who died and his now God of
Psalm before scripture reading and prayer will be to be number 406. 406. Today's scripture reading will come from 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17 in the New King James Version. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ign ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying <clears throat> and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me, in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Pray with me. Dear Lord, we come to you right now just wanting to thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We want to thank you for Jesus Christ and how he died on the cross for us. We want to thank you for your, your word and how it is brought to us, and that it, we can learn and study and understand it and take it and apply it to our lives. Dear Lord, be with these, the elders here at this congregation and the deacons and all the many works that they do, especially the elders, how they shepherd over us, make sure that we're rightly dividing the truth. Dear Lord, be with everyone in this congregation as they take your word and understand it and apply it to their lives and so that we can teach other people and bring them to salvation. Let us do everything that we do today in pleasing in your sight, in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. using a book or a folder this morning, the song after the lesson this morning will be B63, B63 from our folders. And before the lesson will also be in the folders, it'll be B24, B24, please stand, B24. The splendor of a king.
Good morning. It is good to be together always. And I want to pause long enough to thank our women. They put a lot of effort into the ladies' day that was here yesterday. And uh, from everything I heard and saw, it was a good, good day. We thank all of you for your work. We're thankful for the, uh, the good that was done. And, and hopefully it will continue uh, to bring fruit in days to come. I want you to imagine with me for just a moment. Teresa, I live in Clinton. You live other places. We've got firemen in this audience from a lot of different places, and we're thankful for their work. But I want you to imagine that our house is on fire, and I'm trapped inside. I don't know how I'm going to get out. I see my life flash before my eyes. But then, a good Clinton fireman comes through the window or through a door or however he gets in, and he takes me out to safety. How do you suppose I would think about that fellow? What words might I have for him? I can tell you, Teresa and I have had some experience with Clinton firemen, thankfully not because of a fire. But they've come when we've needed them. They're respectful. They're kind. They're helpful. I have nothing but good words for them. They're good men, trying hard. And there's some good women, by the way, at the fire department too, because I've met a few of them. When we heard, read just a few moments ago from 1 Timothy chapter 1, in certain senses of the word, couldn't you say that we heard the Apostle Paul saying, my spiritual house was on fire. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. What did he have to look forward to? Eternal death. And that's all. But Jesus came, and that's what he says, isn't it? He came to die for sinners, Paul said, of whom I am chief. And when he gets through saying that, he, all he can do is burst forth in an expression of praise. What's sometimes called a doxology, which just means glorifying God. <clears throat> And as he glorifies him, he lists things that you and I need to be thinking about and thanking God for every day. He begins with, God is a king. In the book of Daniel chapter 4, we find Daniel uh, interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And as we go to that chapter, you will notice particularly beginning in verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know heaven rules. Nebuchadnezzar heard, but he didn't hear. Daniel gave him the interpretation. He should have understood what he ought to have done. For about a year, he did what was right. Maybe for that time he remembered, I don't know. But there came a day when swollen up with pride, he looked out on that great land over which God had allowed him to be ruler. And he began to think and to brag on himself about all the great things he'd done. 
And God immediately took from him the mind of a man and gave him the mind of an animal. And he crawled on the ground on all fours until his hair grew like eagle's feathers all over his body. And he slept on the, on the ground and the dew of heaven wetted him until... What? Well, listen to the change in Nebuchadnezzar. Beginning in verse 34, that same fourth chapter. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? God's king. Brethren, we may need to just write that down and put it in a prominent place. We get all worried about what's going on in the world. We get worried about the Satan having more control than we'd like him to have, the evil that we see around us. And I'm not saying that that should not bother us. Of course it bothers us. But all the time we need to remember God rules. God is king. One day... All the wicked are going to pay a price for their wickedness. That we can be assured of. Because God is king. But God also is <clears throat> eternal. Listen to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Here is Moses. He's seen a bush that's burning. Well, that's not unusual in a desert wilderness type region, to be honest about it. Dry lightning will strike even in the summertime and a bush will catch fire. But Moses had been around long enough. He'd been serving in his uh, father-in-law's service, taking care of his sheep for 40 years now. And in 40 years, he'd seen bushes burn before, but he'd never seen one that didn't burn out, didn't burn up. Somewhere up on that mountain, he saw a bush burning, but it never did go out. The fire just kept going. So he went to see what, it, what was, that was all about. And when he arrived there, God told him, take the sandals off of your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And God now is choosing Moses to go and deliver his people from Egyptian bondage. And Moses begins to present a series of reasons that's not a good idea. One of those is, well, who in the world am I going to tell them sent me? And the answer comes back from God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. I am who I am. He said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. If we're putting that in our words, we might say it this way. Instead of I am, we might say, I exist by my own power. Nobody created me. I don't have a beginning. I don't have a be an end. I am eternal in nature. I am God. As we think about that, we listen to the singer of Israel. As he sings out about it in Psalm 90, verse 2, and he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, I want us to put those two together. God's king. How long is he king? He's always king. He always was. He always will be. You and I don't need to be afraid. <clears throat> we don't need to let this old world shake our faith because our king rules in heaven. And he will always rule in heaven. 
As Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You can't say that about another ruler on the face of this earth. But God rules over the entire face of the earth. And He is eternal. He also is immortal. Immortal? What does that mean? I think we have a rough idea of the meaning there. But the way I would put it is, God does not decay. You know, I look at, at me. <clears throat> I'm not going to call out any of you or say I look at you and see this, but you know what? We're all decaying. Now, I've talked to you about it before, but you know, when I was a young man, I had what 2015 vision. I could see at 20 feet what I was only supposed to be able to see at 15 feet. Now, take my glasses off, and I'm as blind as a bat. This old body is decaying. It's wearing out, but God doesn't decay. He's immortal. In Romans chapter 1, we find the Apostle Paul writing about our great God. And there he says in verses 22 and 23, professing to be wise, they became fools. He's talking about the Gentiles. The Gentiles had gone into this downward spiral into sin. And now they claim to be wise, but they're really very foolish in what they have to say. Well, go ahead, Paul, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Men will not last. I'm not directing this at the man who's currently in office. But let me, let me, make, a, let me make an observation you can make about any president that's ever been in office. He's not going to live forever. <laughs> He's not going to be president forever. I can guarantee you that. He will decay. He will go the way of all flesh, just like I will. But Almighty God, oh no, never going to decay. He'll always have the same strength he's got today. He'll have the same strength tomorrow. The strength he had when he created the universe, he has even now. God is immortal. And that's really a beautiful thought. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6, the prophet Malachi records the message of the Lord when he says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Are you saved today? It's an important question. If you have recognized that Jesus came to earth as the Son of God to walk among men, if you've acknowledged that before men, if you've seen yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior, if you've repented of those sins, and if you put Jesus on the watery grave of baptism, then you are saved. And here's the good news. As surely as God could and did watch out for Israel, as long as they were his people, today he watches out for the Israel of God. That's the church. Look at Romans chapter 2 at the end and see if I'm not right. We're God's Israel. We're God's people. And the beauty of it is, as we think about it, that our God, our God is immortal. He's not going to decay. He'll always stand by our side. But then Paul says, he's invisible. Invisible? Yeah. Have you ever seen him? One of the saddest things I ever heard was when the Russian cosmonauts went up into space and they came back 
And upon their arrival on earth, one of the things that they said was, we've been in the heavens and we did not see God. I think in a subtle way that some of our astronauts countered that when they were circling the earth and they read scripture that talked about the greatness of God. Invisible, yes, invisible. That's the way Paul describes it, not just here. But also, let's say, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, where he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's talking about Jesus. When Jesus walked on the earth, he was the image of the invisible God. We can't see God, but Jesus came here to show man what God is like. His character, his nature. His love, it's all on display. His compassion, His mercy is all before us. We can't see God. But Jesus came so that we could know what He's like. Back in that book of Romans chapter 1, writing again to those, uh, those Gentiles going down into the spiral of sin, in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, listen to what Paul says. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God may not be visible, but the stars are. God's not visible to the human eye, but the sun is. The moon is. All the planets are visible to us. We see His creation. Why, even on this continent in which we live, we we go somewhere like to the Pacific Ocean and we see the, the mighty actions of God in those waters as they follow a specific pattern. Do you know that they can tell you exactly when high tide is going to be and when low tide is going to be? Why? Because God made it. That's why. It functions exactly like he said it would. Why do we have leap year? Because a year is not 365 days. It's 365 and about a third of a day. And so every fourth year, what do we do? We add a day so that we don't get off on our calculations. Who made it that way? God did. God did. God is invisible, but you can see Him in His work. You can know about Him. Brethren, don't close your eyes to that fact. Don't look down at the dirt and the filth and the wickedness of the earth and forget to look up and see the majesty of God. Invisible? Yes but yet we can see His work. Then He is the only God. That's not in the New King James Version. I appreciate you reading from it, because that's what I read from too, most of the time. But the truth is, it missed this particular translation. If you look in other translations, the New American Standard, the English Standard, the New International Version, All of those have something effectively like this. God is the only God. There's not another one. There's none like Him. You could tell when Paul stood up on Mars Hill that not only was he impressed with that, but he wanted to impress his listeners with that. And so he described him as... Him in whom we live and move and have our very being. He is the only God. There's not another like Him anywhere. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, Moses is delivering his closing speeches to the children of Israel before they enter the promised land. 
And as he does, among other things, he says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He could have said he's the only one. And he'd been right. And effectively, that is what he's saying. There's only one God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, the apostle Paul gives us the, the essence of, of the oneness of the church in which we get to live and enjoy the wonderful privileges and blessings of God. And he does that by saying to us, there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all and through all and in you all. There's no other like him. He's the only one. Can he deliver me? Yes, he can. He is the only God. He can deliver me. He can deliver you. Paul, having burst forth in this praise, has then described God as the king, the king who is eternal, who is immortal, who is invisible. And then he says, we must recognize God deserves honor and glory. Closes out that verse. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't they have repeating numbers in math? Am I right about that? I think pi is one of those numbers that just, just goes on and on and on and on. You can't, you can't ever figure it all the way out. It just keeps on going. Maybe, don't they put a line over it or something like that to indicate this just keeps going? Isn't that the way you do that? Good. I hadn't been in school in a long time, Hannah, thank you. <laughs> but that's what I remember. Is if that number repeats, you just put a line over it. It means it just keeps on going, keeps on going. When Paul says forever and ever, you know, in certain senses, what he would like to say is, God deserves honor and glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And don't stop. Because he will always deserve glory. He will always deserve honor and praise. That's what he's due. That's what we need to see. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in the same book, beginning in verse 15 at the end, then going all the way through verse 16, here's the way that, Jesus, that, that Paul puts it, talking about Jesus. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Potentate. We'd just say ruler. Supreme ruler. That'd be all right. King of kings. He is the one. Does he deserve our prayer? You know he does. He does because of those aspects of his nature, of his character. And so it is that when the writer of the, of the epistle to the Hebrews gets to chapter 13 and verse 15, he finally expresses it this way, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Why are we here today? I know why we ought to be here. We ought to be here because God deserves glory and honor. Because he's king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. He deserves honor and glory. Now here's the interesting thing. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about Christians. He's just been talking about what 
punishment awaits those who've been wrong, who've been torturing God's people, mistreating them. And then in verse 10, he describes Jesus and he says, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you is believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There, Paul says, God deserves glory, not just now, in eternity. And here's the good news. If you're his people, if you and I are what we ought to be, he's going to glorify us. We get to go home. Are you ready to honor God? If you are, why don't you come while we sing? among the saints. So we certainly have uh, missed them. And we're glad you're back. So uh, as we think on those things, let's have a prayer together. 
Father, we thank you so much for your love for us, and we thank you so much for uh, forgiveness. And Father, we recognize that many times we do things contrary to your will. And Father, we pray for the Liddells, and we're thankful that they have returned to the fold, Father. And we pray that we can be an encouragement to them as as they've confessed their sins and help us, Father, to be a shining light for them, Father. And we know that your son is. And so, Father, we ask that you be with the whole family here as we continue to worship you. And, Father, as we honor you through our pra the praise and glory that you deserve that we've talked about. So, Father, again, thank we're thankful for the Liddell family and them returning to us. And, Father, be with us and help them to remain faithful and us also to remain faithful to you. Father, again, we love you and thank you so much for your mercy and grace. We pray, that, pray all this in your son's name. Amen. As we prepare to take up the Lord's Supper this morning, we will sing number six. Number six. Number six. focus on the, the meaning behind this, to, to focus on the fact that Jesus came and, and suffered and died on the cross so that we could have a chance to have a home in heaven with you one day. Ask as we partake of this bread which represents Christ's body that we do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
you bow with me as we continue? Dear Lord, likewise, as we prepare to partake of the fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed on that cross, once again, I ask that you, we would do so in a manner that is pleasing to you, again, helping us to, to focus on the, the reasons behind all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Supper from the Lord's Supper. We'll use this time to get back to the Lord. Bow with me, please. Dear Lord, as, as we prepare to, to give back a portion of, of the blessings you bestow upon us each and every day, we ask that we would do so in, uh, in gladness, with, with happy hearts, that we can, can give back to, to your kingdom here while, while on earth. And, and that it would do good and help this congregation to continue to, to grow and to reach out to the community and, and bring more souls to you. Helps to do so and in a good manner, and once again, that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we want to thank everyone for being here this morning, and uh, it's been a good day so far. I um, do want to recognize that Paul Leggett's back with us this morning, and so if you haven't got to uh, speak to him, it'd be a good day to do that. Um, also, I, from the elders, we I do want to mention, Gary's already mentioned about Ladies' Day yesterday, and want to thank all the ladies who were here and all the men that took part, ladies and men, they took part in helping uh, it be a success. It was, 
I guess it was, I don't know if it was one of our bigger ones, but I know it's bigger than the previous few years. Now that may have been due to COVID, I don't know, but it was uh, well attended. And uh, I think from everything, as, as Gary said, from everything I heard, it was, the lessons were really good. Um, just a reminder of some of the events that are going on today. Uh, at 2 p.m., there will be uh, last leaders practice for his Bible Bowl at 2 p.m., puppets at 3, uh, Bible reading and speech at 4, and girls and guys song leading at 4.30. Also, there's still open slots for TNT. That is, uh, we open up our homes for the youth and let them come and have their Bible study and devotional period. So if you would take part in that, I know that uh, Joey would appreciate it. So uh, please uh, sign up in the foyer to help in that regard. <clears throat> On March the 5th, there will be a teacher appreciation banquet for all teachers in, in, of children and adult classes. There's a sign-up sheet in the, on the bulletin board for that. Uh, there will be a wedding shower honoring Shake Shadricks and Madison Crouch on March the 19th at 3.30 p.m. downstairs in Fellowship Hall. They're registered at Amazon, Target, Red, uh, Bed Bath, and beyond. So um, that's, that's going to be a, an event that uh, I'm sure the ladies will be interested in being part of. Our, the spring teen retreat will be March 24th through 26th at Sardis Lake Christian Camp. Deadline to sign up is next Wednesday. See Joey for more details. And tonight, card care group number three will meet. Group leaders are Sam Clark and Jeff Seal. Again, thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoyed the great lesson we had today. And just so appreciative of the ministers we have, Derek and Gary, and the things that, the things that they do around you. Just have to. <clears throat> we need to open our eyes sometimes to realize how good we've really got it. So if you would. Uh, please stand for our closing prayer and closing song. <clears throat> our closing song this morning will be in our folders, B29. B29. <clears throat> I will say if you're not in car group three tonight, uh, their list is going to be long because we're reaching out to all of our people that came from Ladies Day yesterday. Um, and so if you would like to participate with card group three tonight, um, they could probably use your help. And so cause there's going to be a long list. And so B29 <clears throat> as we close this morning. I will call upon the Lord. with me dear Lord our Heavenly Father we thank you once again for another beautiful Lord's Day and Lord we thank you for for Gary and for Derek and we thank you for our staff Lord we thank you for our elders that lead this congregation Lord we ask at this time that you'll be with all of those of our congregation who are sick or ill or facing surgeries, Lord, we just pray that you be with them, be with their families, and be with all the caregivers who are involved in their care. Lord, we ask that you give them peace, 
give the caregivers a clear mind to make proper decisions. Lord, we thank you for the response of the Liddells this morning. We thank you for their example. And Lord, we ask that you help us all to always strive to show our Christianity daily through the way we live and through the way we interact with other people. Lord, we thank you for your son, for the great sacrifice that he made. And we ask that we all strive to live for him. It's in his son's name we pray. Amen.